That was stupid. I know it was stupid. Really stupid. Hey, I just said it was stupid. So today's Daily Dose of Stupid is kind of the opposite of what I was just talking about, about having productive conversations. And no surprise, it comes on cable TV. I've said this for a long time. One of the problems that I have with some of the cable news shows is you just get a couple of talking heads on there and they just start yelling at one another. I'm not saying that there's never a good place for that. I'm not saying that discussions can't get heated or get very passionate. I'm just saying that as a general rule, that doesn't really help anybody. And it doesn't really change hearts and minds. And so this is an example of that specifically on a a topic we've spent a lot of today's show talking about on abortion and the personhood of the child in the womb. So what we're going to do is we're going to kind of dissect this. And I want you to also, when you're going through this, think about the arguments and the points that they're making, but also think about what would have been a more productive way for them to have had this conversation. So this is on CNN with Chris Cuomo. And he has a CNN uh, contributor, two CNN contributors on. He has Rick Santorum, who, of course, is pro-life. And he ran for president. He came very close to being the Republican nominee. I think he finished second to Mitt Romney. So uh, former senator. Yeah, senator from Pennsylvania. And then he also has Christine Quinn. So we'll go ahead and, and take a look at this clip. I think perverting fact patterns, perverting realities, and trying to demonize what people do, you guys make it sound like this is cheaper than condoms. This is easier than condoms. So just go abort your babies. These are painful decisions for these women. These are things they live with for the rest of their lives. Yeah, I know, and they think about it, and they think about it in a way that you never will, Rick. So you're projecting all these emotions and sensibilities on ethics on people in a decision you'll never make. And Rick, let me just say, Rick, let me just help and support. It's not in your body. Christine, last word to you. Yeah. Let's be clear here, Rick, with all of your distortions and horrible tales. I answered it numerous times. When when a woman gets pregnant, that is not a human being inside of her. It's part of her body. And this is about a woman having full agency and control of her body and making decisions about her body and what is part of her body with medical professionals. Those are the facts, and that is the law of the land. Listen, and they can do whatever they want for that. This is about a woman's body. Listen. All right, so you can see there, not necessarily a productive conversation, but we're going to break down some of the points here. And and what I ask you to talk about or what I ask you to think about beforehand when it comes to having these kinds of discussions, I want you to remember that uh, Rick Santorum, really great guy, somebody that I've actually met, met him right here in the studio. Super nice guy. I think that he's really good at what he does. He, he, he was actually one of my first choices for the uh, governor or sorry, for the president. He was one of the people that I supported. I really would have much rather him run than Mitt Romney. He may have even won. I don't know. But so this is nothing against Rick Santorum, but I don't think he handled that the optimal way, especially considering that he's outnumbered, that he's got two liberals there because they try to bring on a liberal and a conservative when clearly Chris Cuomo is also a liberal. So it's just two liberals shouting at a conservative. But so Chris Cuomo is sitting there and this is where I think that the conversation could have taken a much more productive turn. If he had looked at it through their eyes and looked at it from the perspective of the woman that is going through the process of making a decision to have an abortion, I think that he probably would have come up with this point and it would have been a much more productive conversation. So they've gotten into this really heated discussion about heartbeat laws and laws that are supposed to circumvent Roe v. Wade, which is hilarious that they said that so nefariously. It's like, what they're really trying to do with these heartbeat laws is to get around Roe v. Wade. And Rick Santorum's like, well, yeah, that's the whole purpose of the RP laws. <laughs> They're like, we got him. And Rick Santorum's like, no, that's exactly what we were trying to do. Nobody denies that. You heard with me and Becky Gerritsen earlier in the show, we were talking about that. We're like, well, the bill was crafted specifically to get to attacking Roe v. Wade. That's the whole point. We're trying to ban abortion. We're not hiding the ball here. That's what we want. We want the end of abortion. But nonetheless, so this takes place... And I want you to notice at the very beginning of that clip, 
one of the things that Chris Cuomo does is he makes an emotional appeal, which is not a great form of appeal. Obviously, logical appeal is a superior motive of persuading somebody if you're looking at the strengths of different kinds of appeals. But he tries to make an emotional appeal, which I think is not altogether unfounded. He says, Rick, you'll never understand what it's like for a woman to have to make that kind of decision. He says, you guys always try to paint this as, well, this is cheaper than condoms, which by the way, it's not. Condoms are inc far, far cheaper than getting an abortion. And abortions are very expensive. Uh, it says, and so and we'll just go ahead and abort the baby. First of all, I don't know of any conservative that actually takes that position, but that's the way that Cuomo tries to represent it because Cuomo is obviously very pro-choice. I mean, for goodness sake, his brother is the guy who signed the bill into law to abort a child up until the point of birth. This is not somebody that is even away. This is not somebody that sympathizes with the pro-life movement. But nonetheless, that's what's going on here. Even though he's supposed to be some kind of objective journalist, he's going on and he's talking about this with Rick Santorum, and he makes this appeal that well, these women are going through a traumatic experience. This is a decision that affects them. It affects the way they live. It affects who they are. And they have to live with that decision for the rest of their life. Do you know why that appeal is powerful? Because it's true. It is. I concede that. Here's the question that we should be asking, though, because I actually agree with Chris Cuomo on that. I know, shocker, I feel like the, the world's about to explode, but I'm actually agreeing with Chris Cuomo on something. Here's the question that nobody asked, and I think it would have been a very different conversation if Rick Santorum had asked this question. All he would have done is had to ask, okay, Chris, I, I agree. That's not an easy thing for a woman to go through, obviously. The question is, why is it difficult? Why is that a difficult decision for a woman to make? Because instinctively, every human being knows that's a baby. The reason that this is a decision that she has to deal with for the rest of her life, and there are women that continue to have problems sleeping, they have problems uh, with intimacy, and I'm not even talking about sex, even though that's part of it, but I'm talking about emotional intimacy with partners from then on because they have so much guilt that builds up in them from their abortions. This is a common thing, and it happens with a large percentage of the women that go through abortions. They do have guilt and remorse, and it's a difficult decision for them to reach. Why? Because they know inherently it's wrong. A lot of them still make the decision to go through with it, and a lot of them don't. But the point is... Chris Cuomo is asserting correctly that this is something that women really struggle with as to whether or not they are going to go through and get an abortion. And the reason that that is a struggle, the reason it is difficult, the reason there is some cognitive dissonance is because God designed women in such a way that they are supposed to protect their children even if it costs them their own life. And instinctively, Human beings, with even a monicum of common sense, understand that the baby is still a baby, even when it's in the womb. And because of that, and because that cognitive dissonance exists, and because they know that it's their responsibility as mothers to protect their children, yes, it's very difficult and painful, and it's something that, in many cases, haunts them for the rest of their life, because they know it's human. And that's the question that nobody on that panel asked. Because I think Chris is right about that. But the question is, why is he right? Chris Cuomo unwittingly just made a pro-life argument. He asserted that this baby really is a human being because he was saying that there is a level of remorse that comes with the decision to have an abortion. And this is a painful, difficult decision to live with specifically because of that. So a little bit later in the clip, you'll hear Christine Quinn, the other person, the lady there that is on that panel, say that, no, 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 this, the baby isn't human, which again, we just discussed, accidentally Chris Cuomo made the case that it was. 
but Christine Quinn sitting there saying, no, 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 you don't understand. The baby is not a human. That is part of her body. This is about her having bodily autonomy. This is about her having agency over her body. And that is part of her body. It's not a human. So the baby's not a human. Then what is it? What is it? How do you identify a human? This is another question that would have been really good to ask at this point. How can you define human being? Because I guarantee you they will not be able to come up with one that does not include children in the womb. If you take a zygote, a fertilized egg, after the point of conception, and you were to extract the DNA out of the nucleus of that cell, and you were to put it under a microscope and do DNA testing, you would find that it is human DNA. It's not a cheetah. It's not an elephant. It's not a whale. It's not a crocodile. That is human DNA. And it is human DNA that no other human in the world has. Unless, of course, you happen to have a twin. That would be the only exception. If you have an identical twin, yes, another person does have that DNA, and we would still think of those two as two completely distinct people. But nonetheless, that is not the mom's DNA. It's not the dad's DNA. That is a completely unique human genetic signature that you will have for the rest of your life. Every single cell in my body has a nucleus filled with DNA that has not changed since the time I was born. Some of the sequences may have been turned on or off, you know, when you're going through things like puberty, but the point is the genetic sequence is still the same and always has been, and it will be until the day I die. If they dig my body up in 10,000 years, find my remains, and do a DNA test on me, they'll say, yep, that's him. His DNA didn't change from the point that he was conceived until now. So this thing isn't a gorilla or a whale or a crocodile or a space alien. We would concur that that is human DNA, and it's human DNA that is completely distinct from the mother or the father. And so she asserts somehow that this is part of the woman's body. But if it has its own unique genetic signature, how can that be true? Is my arm your arm? Well, no. Well, how can you tell it's not my arm just because it's attached to your body? Well, my arm has a completely unique genetic signature. Oh, so in other words, your body's not part of my body. You're a different human than I am. Why? Because of our DNA. And also because it happens to be attached to me and I can control it and you can't. <laughs> but the point here is the, there's no way logically or biologically that you can assert this is a part of a woman's body. Common sense tells you this. You don't have to have an advanced degree in genetics. Are you really going to tell me because body parts develop pretty early, most of them in the first trimester when it comes to pregnancy, are you really going to sit there and tell me that the mother has 20 fingers, 20 toes, four lungs, four eyes, two hearts, two brains, two nervous systems? And let's also look at the behavioral part of this. Very early on, the babies are already moving and thinking on their own. They're making their own decisions on their own actions. Every function of my body is controlled by my brain. Right now, as I'm sitting here before you, Every single action going on in my body is something my brain is telling the rest of my body to do. Even involuntary muscle movements like my breathing or my heartbeat, they are all ultimately controlled by my brain. I may not be aware or conscious of them, but the point is my brain is doing the lifting there. My brain is the one sending those electrical signals to my body and causing my body to do those things. That's not the case with a baby. When a mother is pregnant, there is a separate brain inside her body, her baby's brain, that is telling its body to do those things. Obviously not breathing, because it's not breathing yet. But the point is, its heartbeat and all of its other involuntary muscle functions, those are taking place automatically. And so are the voluntary ones, where the baby moves around or kicks. When the baby pushes against the, the uterine wall, or sorry, the wall of the womb, and the mother can feel it moving, that's not the mom doing that. That's not her brain controlling that function. And so how can you say that it's her body? It's not her body. It's very clearly the body of another person living inside of her. And on the whole thing about having, you know, four arms and four legs, and let's also think about this. Let's say her baby is male. 
are we to suggest there that she has male private parts? Because the baby does. And if that's part of her body, then I guess you would have to say that she is both male and female. The transgender people have finally figured out a way for someone to be neither male nor female. Just say that the male babies growing inside pregnant women to say that they're male and female because they have both parts. This is insane. No logic, logical, clear-thinking person would ever assert that this child growing inside the mother is a part of her body. And let's also remember that not only can the baby move independently of its mother's will, in other words, no matter what the mom's brain does, the baby can move its hand or move its leg, let's also remember that the baby has its own sleep schedule. Babies in the womb, they can sleep. And they don't necessarily sleep at the same time as the mom. Uh, I had a family member that just recently was pregnant, and she was talking about this, how uh, they did an ultrasound and couldn't really, really see very much because the baby was asleep. Uh, but nonetheless, this ha it has its own sleep pattern, and it also has its own thinking, its own independent movement. It has its own thought. One of the things that they're really concerned about now, which is a good thing, they say that babies start learning language before they're even born, that they already recognize their parent's voice, that they can distinguish them from other people by the time they're born because they learned all that stuff while they were in the womb. So they're already thinking, they're already learning, they already have their own sleep patterns, their own independent movements. How can you in any way assert that that baby is a part of the woman's body? It's certainly connected to the woman's body. It's certainly dependent on the woman's body. But it's not a part of the woman's body. And by that logic, nursing children would be in the same boat. Because nursing children connect themselves to the mother's body to receive nourishment, and they are definitely dependent on their mother to be able to survive, are you going to say that their life is of less value now because they are dependent upon the mother? That doesn't make any sense. Are you going to assert that that baby is a part of the woman's body just because it relies on her body to survive? Again, doesn't make any sense. But... Just for the sake of argument, because, of course, this show is tactics, and we're talking about debate tactics here, let's play along with their argument. Let's assume that their argument is correct. Let's assume that this baby really is a part of the woman's body. Let's ask some follow-up questions. If the baby is really a part of the woman's body, if that's really what's going on, then let's go back to the original question we were talking about. Why is there a mourning period? Why is it that the mother feels distraught about the baby no longer being with her? Why is this a decision that they have to live with for the rest of their life, and in many cases, something that they look back on and regret? Why is that the case? Because I can tell you right now from experience, when they removed my tumor, I was thrilled. No remorse. I mean... I missed the body part that it was connected to, but I don't miss the tumor. It was causing me a great deal of pain, and it was endangering my life. I don't miss it. Not at all. If you've ever had your tonsils or your appendix taken out when they were causing you some kind of great pain, you don't really miss it. You don't mourn for it because you realize it's not a life. Now, if you lose your hand or lose something that you use every day, okay, I, I get that there's a little difference there, but you still don't recognize it as being a human life. You still don't recognize that there was something immoral about that taking place. And so that's one big point there, but also let's just assume from the, the medical perspective, let's ask that question. Let's say that it really is a part of your body, that it's a organ just like every other part of your body. Is it okay for a doctor to just open up a healthy person and take out a completely healthy organ? Is it okay for them to remove a lung or a kidney? Just get rid of it? If a person walks into a doctor's office and says, Doc, I really want you to amputate my arm. Is that okay? Is that something that a, any sane doctor would do to just cut off a perfectly healthy part of your body? No. We would say that that's mutilation. We would say that that's completely unethical. And we would say that that person is crazy for wanting that to take place. So even if you did assert that it was part of the woman's body, that's still not a very good case for abortion being legalized. Because any doctor worth his salt, if somebody were to come in and say, I want you to remove this completely healthy part of my body, that doctor is going to look them in the eye and say, uh, no. 
if you have some kind of medical complication, if you're you know, your appendix is about to bust and that could cause you to die from infection, okay, then we'll talk. But I'm not just going to start taking healthy body parts out of your body. That's mutilation. And no doctor with any even a hint of ethics would consider doing something like that. And so really, no matter how you come at this angle, anybody that's taking a stance that this is not a human life independent of the mother, with its own body, its own brain function, its own thoughts, everything else, is being completely anti-logic and anti-science. Normally, this is the part of the video where you would expect me to ask you to like the video and subscribe to the channel. But the truth is, I don't really care whether you do or not. In fact, you know what? Don't subscribe. It's not like there's a lot of really important stuff going on in the world in the state of Alabama that you should probably be aware of. So, yeah, go ahead and subscribe. Or don't. I don't really care. Reverse psychology. Boom.